The Kanoa Valley, narrow and thick with trees, runs about 50 miles in a southwest direction. Years ago, nature threw together in this valley a treasure chest. It has the river and air, natural gas, and coal. The most important of these for carbide was natural gas. The other chemicals companies that had come to the Kanawha Valley came here because of the salt brine from which they produced chlorine, a product that carbide used. Also, the navigable river and the three railroad lines were important attractions. George Oliver Kerm and his boys moved down from their experimental headquarters in Clendenin and began commercial production here at South Charleston in 1925. The first synthetic product sold on a really large scale was Celesol solvent, which was first shipped from the new South Charleston plant in October 1925. Celesov resulted from Carbide's search for a solvent for coal carnauba wax. The formula they devised wouldn't work for carnauba wax, but its solvent powers and mild, pleasant odor had to be useful, perhaps as a carrier liquid for flavoring oils in the food industry. So the trademark flavor oil was taken. Unfortunately, it was such a good solvent that it also affected the lining of the stomach, so it was never sold. Researchers then tried it out as a solvent for lacquers, and thus, it became the first of Carbide's complete line of solvents. What Carbide discovered in this instance and in many others yet to come, that products which might fail in one application might have great potential in others. Another 1925 product of major importance was ethylene glycol. Dow Chemical Company had become somewhat familiar with ethylene and its derivatives and had demonstrated that ethylene glycol could be nitrated to make low freezing point dynamite. For some reason, they weren't able to make many sales. Carbide, however, sold much of the product for dynamite purposes and went on to market it as an antifreeze for cars under the familiar trade name Prestone. Dell had simply never thought of this purpose. About the same time, 1927, Carbide needed to expand again, but where to go? Kerm convinced Carbide management to purchase Blaine Island, which sat in the center of the Kanawha River directly across from his two-year-old plant, Management was not easily persuaded this was the right thing to do. After all, flooding in the valley was not uncommon, and Blaine Island sat low in the water. But once again, Kerm's tenacity paid off. The island was purchased, barge loads of dirt were brought in, and the island was built up by 15 feet. The existing pontoon footbridge connecting the island to the mainland was replaced with an automobile bridge. From the first few products developed came many new applications. Ethylene was sold as a ripening agent for fruit and provided a fairly important source of income to support research for other materials. Ethylene dichloride proved to be a good solvent and extractant. It was used to separate vitamin D from cod liver oil, but that wasn't exactly a huge market. And by 1932, 17 million pounds of the stuff was brimming out of every available storage tank carbide owned. And suddenly, the breakthrough came when dry cleaners found it useful as a major cleaning fluid. Carbitol, a new solvent, was the next in our developing line of glycol ether started with Celesol. Uses for it came rapidly, and at one point it became so valuable that our triplex safety glass customers in Clifton, New Jersey, practically cornered the market to ensure they'd have enough on hand to keep their plant running. 
Another important family of carbide chemicals was started in 1928 with the sale of triethanolamine. 1929 was a milestone year with our first sales of acetone and ethylene oxide. Our new process for synthetic acetone made the United States independent of fermentation acetone. Finally, 1929 saw the first commercial production of vinyl chloride in the United States. This compound was the basis of the vinyl resin industry, which in turn stimulated the entire field of thermoplastic resins. Carbide called its new product Vinylite and made the soft white powder in the South Charleston plant from petroleum gas and chlorine. One of the first large volume uses for this resin was in the manufacture of box toes for shoes. RCA was another early customer for vinyl resin. They used some two to 3,000 pounds per month for the manufacture of 16-inch broadcasting records. One of Union Carbide's greatest breakthroughs occurred in 1930 with the world's first production of synthetic ethanol. Prior to that time, the French, Germans, and English had all failed in their attempts to synthesize ethanol, primarily due to corrosion problems in their equipment. Members of the Chemical Corporation teamed up with corrosion specialists in the Electrometallurgical Company, and together they licked this problem. Well, since Uncle Sam had placed a $20 per gallon tax on the perfectly drinkable ethyl alcohol, security had to be very tight. As a result, the ethanol unit was built in the most remote part of the plants and was operated under the direct supervision of federal agents. The chemicals group was well on its way. The panic of 1929 and subsequent depression failed to halt progress. In fact, in 1929, gross chemical sales were $7 million. Profits after taxes were $2.5 million. Maybe George Kern really knew what he was talking about. The only major acquisition of the 30s was the absorption in 1939 of Bakelite Corporation, a veteran plastics maker with the sales of $11 million. Carbide had become Bakelite chief supplier of methanol for the formaldehyde in phenol formaldehyde plastics. Overall, the company compiled an enviable sales record during the period 1925 to 1939. 120 chemical compounds were sold, of which 83 were first produced in the United States by carbide. In just 14 years, the South Charleston plant had grown to become the largest chemical plant in the world. In fact, amazingly, most of that growth occurred during the throes of the Great Depression. There are many fascinating stories about the early development of chemicals within carbide and the sales efforts during that period. Many are forgotten or are lost with those to whom they happened. But all of them played an important role in making carbide the company that it is today. <laughs>